The town of Terrace in British Columbia has both an incredible skiing culture and incredible ski hill. While most visitors today might assume that Shames Mountain has been always part of the community for a long time, the reality is that Shames is actually the sixth ski hill to operate in Terrace. The main focus of this video will be examining the fifth ski hill, Kitsum Kalem, as well as exploring the four original hills and discussing the bumpy road to the Shames Mountain development. This is going to be a huge episode that I'm so excited to make. So without further ado, let's dive in. Before we get to Kitsum Kalem, let's rewind to the four hills that predated Kitsum Kalem. Downhill skiing in Terrace dates back to the 1930s, when ski pioneers looked for ideal sites to practice the sport. From 1936 to 1953, Terrace Mountain was the town's local ski hill until the club moved to Thornhill Golf Course. The club installed a homemade rope to win the golf course, which became the first ski lift in Terrace. Three years later, the town ski hill moved to a location on Old Remo Road. This location proved to not have sufficient snow coverage, prompting the ski club to move again to a new location on Bornite Mountain in 1962. Bornite Mountain provided better snow coverage, however, did not have any road access. This prompted the ski club once again to move, this time to Northern Heights in 1968. The ski hill was closer to Terrace, had road access, and two rope toes, though a few lousy snow years ultimately killed skiing at Northern Heights. Okay, now we get to Kitsum Kalem. In the early 1970s, the people of Terrace had realized that they needed something different. Thus, a public committee was formed which aimed to find a true mountain to build a true ski hill. After a good snow year, the committee found a hill directly north of town that had existing logging road access. Apparently, under all the snow, the committee found the hill reminiscent of Red Mountain. Thus, the commission quickly launched Kitsum Kalem, which was 100% financed by the citizens of Terrace. Unfortunately, the mountain was built on emotions rather than logic, and was extremely poorly designed. The committee who were in charge of finding the location were all proficient skiers, while most of the rest of the town's people weren't. This led to the committee picking an overly steep mountain that most of the town couldn't even ski. The rope toe from the 1950s was relocated for the beginner slope, and a Mueller double was constructed in 1975 that serviced intermediate to expert terrain and traveled all the way up the mountain. Kitsum Kalem officially opened to the public in December of 1975, which was a really good snow year. However, through its nine years of operations, the hill really suffered from two big problems. First, the hill had almost no beginner terrain apart from the Bunny Hill. This led to all the beginner skiers traveling to Smithers or Prince Rupert to ski there. The second problem was that Kitsum Kalem only had a base elevation of 216 meters above sea level. While the first few years of operations were really good, Kitsum Kalem often suffered from poor snow years. The hill also had no snowmaking. However, despite these challenges, Kitsum Kalem consistently expanded their terrain offerings, adding several new runs almost every year. As a result, the ski area grew from this in 1975 to this in 1984. In 1978, Kitsum Kalem installed a new Doppelmayr T-bar further down the main mountain that serviced beginner to intermediate terrain. While this T-bar was a helpful new beginner terrain addition to Kitsum Kalem, it still didn't help that the area suffered from poor snow, poor exposure, and an extremely low elevation. Kitsum Kalem never broke even, and in its last two years of operation, the ski hill didn't even open. In this regard, the last operating season of Kitsum Kalem was 1984. However, in 1986, a referendum asked the citizens of Terrace if the money-losing ski hill should continue to operate. Unsurprisingly, a majority of the citizens in Terrace voted to close the mountain permanently. While Kitsum Kalem failed at being a good ski resort, it did succeed at creating a deep culture of skiing in Terrace. That same year that Kitsum Kalem closed, a new group titled Shames Mountain Ski Corporation purchased all the assets of Kitsum Kalem at an auction. They paid $322,000 for this equipment, which was all financed from the local provincial government. The group proposed to develop a new ski area at a higher elevation site that would be more sustainable than Kitsum Kalem. However, the road to the Shames development was no easy feat. 
Shames repeatedly had to ask the government to renegotiate the payment deadlines, and only actually made one payment between 1986 and 1990. In 1986, a group of local residents, along with ski smithers, fiercely banded against Shames, lobbying the government not to consider further development. However, after a study came out that said the development of Shames wouldn't hurt ski smithers, the government gave all their preliminary approvals. The next obstacle Shames faced was road access. Shames was in an extremely remote valley, which required a costly access road to be constructed up the mountain. Paired with the fact that Shames had reportedly asked the government to renegotiate loan payments, you can see how precarious the situation was for Shames. After three years of delays, bad press, and threats from the government to call Shames' loan, the road was finally constructed in 1989. It was an extremely precarious situation that could have easily ended with no ski hill. Once the road was finally built, Shames realized that they overpaid for the Kitsum Kalem equipment after a bank assessment placed the total value of all assets at only $70,000, when Shames had paid $320,000. The drive terminal of the double was practically garbage at this point, which meant that Shames had to buy a costly new drive terminal from Borvig. But the area barely managed to finally open in 1990. Shames' existence hasn't been without its fair share of challenges since opening. After years of the mountain sitting on the market for sale, closure was feared across the town. This all led to My Mountain Co-op to form and purchase all assets for only $600,000 in 2013. Since then, the mountain has thrived and it continues to economically support the town while preserving the legacy of skiing in Terrace. But now, back to Kitsum Kalem. Kitsum Kalem was not an easy mountain by any stretch. However, the area can generally be broken into two sections, serviced by both the double chair and the T-bar. Let's start with the double. This chairlift was quite long at around 1.3 kilometers in length and gained around 627 meters of elevation. At the top of the chairlift, there were a few options that greeted the skier. There are two green runs, Sleeping Beauty and Kalem Cut, which are both quite steep. Sleeping Beauty could easily have been a road, though it gets fairly steep in some parts and could easily pass for a blue run. Kalem Cut is a bit more consistent, but gets quite steep near the top. Once the beginner skier made it down the steeper sections of both runs, there are two other green runs. The Milky Way Trail cuts off Kalem Cut and is a much more gentle green run. Similarly, T Totter comes off Sleeping Beauty, looping the skier to the T-bar. I am assuming that at least Sleeping Beauty and Kalem Cut were groomed somewhat regularly. The double didn't have much in the way for intermediate terrain. The upper part of AOT Kettle was similar in pitch to Kalem Cut, but it runs a bit closer to the chair. The lower part crosses over the Exhibition Trail and is more of an easy runout to avoid the bottom part of Exhibition. Similarly, the double trouble run was similar to Teetotter, just a bit steeper. It is the expert skier who would have been the most at home at Kissum Kalem. Exhibition, the most recognizable trail of the resort, follows the double chairlift almost its entire length. This trail was steep and demanding, filled with moguls, rocks, and extremely steep pitches. As the name of the cliff implies, this trail was also extremely steep and narrow, with a fork branching skiers off to either Exhibition or Sleeping Beauty. I can't seem to locate where the surprise trail, number 6, was on Google Earth, which makes me question if this was more of a glade trail. The Caterpillar Run is a long, fairly steep black run that I can only assume was filled with moguls. It ends at the bottom of the T-bar and is over a kilometer in length. Finally, the pipeline trail leads from the Milky Way Green Run down to the bottom of the sunny side rope toe. Now, let's break down the T-bar. This lift was the lowest point at the resort and it had its own parking lot. The T-bar serviced some of Kitsum Kalem's best intermediate terrain. Runs such as Moonshine, Show Off, and Molster Alley all branch off the T-bar and featured night skiing. These three trails have a pretty consistent intermediate pitch, and I can only assume they were all groomed. The lower part of Teetotter also wound its way down the T-bar, as well as a green access trail from one of the parking lots. Additionally, the T-bar acts as the lower part of the Caterpillar Black Run. Finally, it's worth noting that Kitsum Kalem had two rope toes. The Sunnyside Toe actually descended into a valley, servicing its own terrain, as well as access from the Pipeline Run. The Lodge Toe only served as access from the double chair to either the Lodge or the Sunnyside Rope Toe. Normally, when I create Lost Resorts videos, I feel a sense of sadness as I document what once was, but no longer is. 
but I love the story here. The resilience of the town of Terrace is truly remarkable, and the town now has a much better ski hill because of it. This history deserves to be told, and we can all learn from the mistakes of Kitsum Caleb. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, be sure to subscribe to my channel. And until next time, this is Skier72.